Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, a very warm welcome to all of you and good evening also to all of, uh, of them, of you who are following on at home on the live stream. So I would like to welcome you to our two days public lecture, View Matters, View Talks, on the topic of macroeconomic policy in times of war. My name is Tatjana Opitz and I am the Vice Rector in charge of infrastructure and digitalization here at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. As part of the VU Matters VU Talks, a series of unique panel discussions and lectures, VU has created a platform which facilitates sharing of knowledge and insights between academia and public. The objective is to address economic and social issues and contribute to responsible understanding and accountable economic action in order to solve economic, social and ecological challenges. Scientists, researchers and experts from the corporate world as well as from public institutions share their expertise on current issues with an interested public. Now on tonight's topic. Ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow on December 15th, the European Central Bank's Governing Council will meet and decide on interest rates. For this decision, the Governing Council will be assisted with new forecasts for inflation and economic growth. Predicting the future of macroeconomic variables in European countries has become an extraordinary complex task in 2022. The war in Ukraine has led to a significant increase in economic uncertainty worldwide and, of course, in particular in Europe. Currently, we experience double-digit inflation rates in the euro area a phenomenon that would have been unthinkable less than a year ago. Conducting monetary and fiscal policy in an environment of high uncertainty is extremely challenging. Uncertainty tends to reduce the effectiveness of fiscal policy since the private sector tends to be cautious when facing a more unpredictable future and responds less to fiscal policy actions. The same way, enacting monetary policy becomes complicated in the context of low predictability of inflation and output growth. How can we improve our macroeconomic models to ensure that predictions and the estimated effects of policy impulses remain credible and can serve evidence-based policymakers. I would like to take the opportunity to thank the Department of Economics for organizing this lecture tonight. So I will stop here with my introduction and hand over to the experts, first of all, to Professor Jesus Crespo Quaresma. I'm not sure I pronounced it Correctly, yeah. Jesus for sure, but the rest <laughs> yeah. I'm not so sure. <laughs> Professor for macroeconomics at our university, who will introduce our guest speaker and the moderator. And Jesus, the stage is yours. And ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a very nice evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tatiana. You pronounced the name correctly, indeed. Uh, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of the Department of Economics, I would like to welcome you to today's lecture. Today's lecture, as we heard, is part of VU Matters, VU Talks, a series of lectures and panel discussions here at the Vienna University of Economics and Business, but it's also our VU Lecture in Economics, which is a, a tradition that we have been keeping for over a decade, and today we have actually our 11th VU lecture in economics, and we are really happy to have Francesco 
uh, talking today on the issues of macroeconomic policy and their uncertainty. The idea of the VU lecture in economics is to bring researchers, policymakers, students, and the interested public together in order to discuss relevant topics related to economics and economic policy. And today's topic is particularly relevant. We are going to talk about macroeconomics under uncertainty. And I could not imagine a better person to have around as Francesco Zanetti. Francesco is Associate Professor in Economics at the University of Oxford and the David Richards Fellow of Wadham College. He's an extraordinary macroeconomist working on issues related to fiscal policy, monetary policy, labor market dynamics, and the effects of the zero lower bound of interest rate on macroeconomic policy effectiveness, which is a part has been a particularly important topic over the last decade. He has published in numerous of many of the best scientific journals in economics and is currently the associate editor of the Economic Journal, the Journal of Money, Credit and Banking, Macroeconomic Dynamics, or the Oxford Bulletin of Economics and Statistics, just to name a few of them. We are also extremely happy to have uh, Katrin Dravich, Associate Professor in Economics at our department, moderating the evening. She's a macroeconomist working on issues related to macroeconomic policy as well, from the point of view uh, mostly of macroeconomic theory and dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. Without further ado, I leave the floor to both Katrin and Francesco. Thank you very much. Starter. After your talk, I don't introduce myself now. Right now I'm doing nothing, so... Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you, Jesus, for this uh, uh, very nice introduction. It's really my pleasure to be here with you today and uh, um, tell you about uh, this uh, line of research that I'm, I'm developing about uh, the uh, <clears throat> signaling effect of fiscal announcements. So the, 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 in this lecture that is about uh, um, macroeconomic policy in times of wars, the key message that I want to uh, give you is that times of wars are at times when uncertainty increases. And when uncertainty goes up, policy may work differently than when uncertainty is low. So this project is really about thinking, if we are in a context of war, in a context when uncertainty goes up, we don't know about what will happen about the future, and we see fiscal policy uh, supporting the economy, is it good news or bad news? It can be good news because the government is trying to uh, stimulate the economy and give support when, when the, economy, the economy is going down. But at the same time, it can be that we can read the action of the government as conveying some knowledge that the government has about the severity of the future outturns. And so when we see government spending a lot of money in times of war, it may disclose uh, information that the government has about the bleak outcomes ahead. And therefore, instead of stimulating the economy, the economy will tank. There will be expectations of agents that they say, OK, I see this big package is great. From one side, demand will go up. The government will, will spend a lot to support the economy. But on the other side, we will start having expectations that are bleak, thinking, oh, well, the government knows that if the package is so large, there is something bad going ahead, and that can be contractionary. And so the key of this talk is to tell you about how that can happen using an economic model, and then test it in the data. And to test it, we will use a unique country that give us a natural experiment in this type of ex experiments, policy experiment, that is Japan. But this is basically the gist of the talk that uh, I will give you uh, today. So, in times of war, the main point that I want to make is that there is a lot of uncertainty. Typically, times of war is when uncertainty goes up, when there, are, there is a conflict right now, for instance, in Europe, between Ukraine and, uh, and Russia. And uh, this conflict obviously is affecting those two countries, but it affects also us uh, in, in Europe and in the United Kingdom. 
And uh, it affects us mainly because there is uncertainty. What will be the price of uh, oil going forward? How gas will develop? And, and that um, um, may play an important role in uh, the effectiveness of macroeconomic policies. And uh, in particular, in times of wars, the policy that typically is used to counteract uh, this uncertainty is fiscal policy. And so that's why in this uh, uh, talk, I'm, I'm, gonna co I'm gonna talk a lot about fiscal policy. And fiscal policy is a very natural tool. There is uncertainty about what will happen in a, in a war. We don't know uh, about the price of oil. We see maybe that oil price goes up now. Let's spend uh, and to support uh, uh, the economy. And so uh, I think uh, the, the, the key point of, of this, uh, uh, the first part of the talk is that when fiscal policy is geared to support the economy, then is when we can have this negative channel. If we know that we have spending that is related to some future uh, economics uh, outlook, then we also interpret the spending as revealing how bleak will be the uh, uh, outlook of the economy. And uh, so fiscal packages may actually reveal information on the severity of the outturn. And uh, the key aspect of this project is to show that this channel is very prominent when there is uncertainty. And so when we are in times of wars and when there is uncertainty, these channels materializes. When uncertainty instead is low, like in normal times, this channel is, 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 is milder, and therefore when we have spending, that stimulates the economy. So the challenge that we faced is, is uh, this project is with other economists. Let me just uh, uh, say uh, who are the other um, co-authors on, on this paper. This is going to be an academic uh, paper in, in a couple of weeks, so if you will go on my webpage, you, you will see it. But it's Leonardo Melosi at the uh, Chicago Fed, Hiroshi Morita at the Jose University, who is here in the audience as well, Anna Rogantini Pico at the uh, uh, Riksbank in, in Sweden. And um, in, the, in, in this project, uh, we uh, basically want to look at this feature on uh, what is the importance of signaling effect and we want to link them with uncertainty. To make the point then, when there is uncertainty, fiscal policy is not so effective. So, the key question that then I will uh, um, um, uh, answer in this, uh, in this talk is about how effective are fiscal stimuli to mitigate the severity of recessions? And the key point is that when we see a fiscal stimulus, the size of it may convey information about the government's view of the economy. I.e., the stimulus can have uh, uh, bad news uh, uh, um, because uh, uh, it shows that the government may act, may enact, uh, uh, may have uh, public spending because it forecasts or it predicts that the economy is going down. And so the announcement in fiscal policy, they have two components. One that is the standard expansionary effect because fiscal stimulus would increase aggregate demand. And the other one that we, 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 we studied and we show uh, it is there in the data and in models, is a contractionary effect related with the signaling that fiscal policy does about the future of the economy and the effect that that signaling has on the expectations of the agents, that then they determine the actions of the agents today. So the key question of, 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 of this uh, uh, talk is about uh, showing you some evidence of those effects. It's, it's not easy to find this evidence because you need to have uh, uh, experiments, policy experiments, where the fiscal uh, uh, stimulus is geared towards some potentially bad news that you have in the economy. And the times of wars are excellent for that. Or times of natural disasters. That if you have a natural disaster, so if you have a war, Immediately, if you see government spending, that can be informative on the severity of war. 
And so part of the talk uh, will be uh, to uh, show you that in a country like Japan, where there are a lot of natural disasters, and there is a lot of policy uh, uh, in place, fiscal policy, in order to prevent those natural disasters, they give us a chance to test this theory, to see, okay, we have a country where policy is geared towards uh, potential disasters. What is the effect of this policy? Is it always expansionary or not? So that will be how we will test uh, the theory that I just said about uh, the signaling effect of fiscal policy. And uh, what we will show you is that actually there can be a strong component of signaling effect that neutralizes the expansionary uh, intention of fiscal policy. So fiscal policy, when you have fiscal policy in times of war, it's less effective. So if you want to have the same effect, maybe what you need is a big push, that fiscal policy moves even more. Or you need to think about uh, how you convey your message about fiscal policy. So what are the main findings that uh, uh, we find is that one is that we construct a novel data set to test this theory. Um, and uh, the theme of this uh, lecture is, is about war. Um, fortunately, we don't have many wars such that we have many data points to, convey, to test this theory. So what we did, we used Japan uh, as a natural experiment. In Japan is a country that uh, it, it has, unfortunately, uh, many natural disasters. And as I said earlier on, these natural disasters, they then force the government to have uh, uh, some uh, stimulus package to help the economy. So there you can have, potentially, this signaling effect, because in Japan, when you have a disaster, then you, you have an announcement of a fiscal plan, and that announcement can tell you, you can extract from that announcement, potentially, uh, a bleak outlook for Japan. If, if, if this theory is right, what you would expect is that the fiscal intervention there is not as effective as in normal time. So what we do then, based on this idea, we collected the daily data on Japanese stock prices, and then we look at the narrative records from press releases about a set of uh, extraordinary fiscal uh, packages uh, introduced by the Japanese government from 2011 and 2020. And, idea, and the idea there is to see, is the stock prices sensitive to those announcements? And uh, if we compare uh, the response of stock prices to those announcements, when we have natural disaster, fiscal policy gears to our natural disaster, does it have a different effect of announcement when we have fiscal policy that is not uh, done uh, uh, because of those disasters? For instance, if you, when Japan won the Olympics, immediately needed to modernize the country, to have more infrastructure. To do that, it announced a series of fiscal spending. That is not related to any disaster, so it's not revealing any signal that something is going bad. If we compare these two groups of uh, fiscal interventions, do we see any difference? And from this comparison, then we can say whether we do have a signaling effect or not. And that's actually what we did. We tested it, and I will show you the uh, uh, empirical results later on, but uh, we actually find two main things, that there are this fiscal stimulus, the one related with a, a future outlook of the economy that can be negative, the natural disaster packages, uh, were often interpreted as negative views by the stock market. So you see that the stock market, instead of going up as much as it would typically go to a given size of fiscal expansion, it would go up less or even be negative. And uh, the bearish response of the stock market are more common when uncertainty is large. So, and this is the real finding of this, uh, of, of, of this project, that what really matters for the signaling effect is not only that fiscal policy is linked with the future state of the economy, but that there is uncertainty. When there is uncertainty, like in times of wars, this channel is prominent. When there is not uncertainty, this channel is there, but not, is not very big. So here, the big message is that in times of wars, in times of uncertainty, the effectiveness of fiscal policy changes. And it's precisely because there is uncertainty 
Without uncertainty, this channel is very weak or is not even there. So before I go into the details here, this is a slide uh, that is meant to tell you that there has been a lot of research in signal signaling effects for monetary policy, but, uh, but not research whatsoever in fiscal policy. And at the same time, in fiscal policy, many, many researchers, they found that the spending multiplier, how much you, uh, if you increase government spending of 1%, how much your output reacts, that's the multiplier, is state dependent, meaning that it, it varies across the business cycles. And this project, uh, the, the, this, this lecture is really about telling you absolutely, and the new angle that we want to uh, 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 show is that uncertainty and the signaling effect are critical. When you have a lot of uncertainty and uh, when, uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, policy is geared towards uh, supporting the economy, then the fiscal multiplier goes down. And so the, the point here is that this is really a novel finding also in the academic uh, uh, literature. It's not only something that is very important for governments, but it also contributes to this uh, uh, extensive literature that, that you see there. So now, what, what I want to do to substantiate uh, the message that uh, I gave you today, I want you to do two things. First, uh, 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 the, main, the first two things is to show you that in models of uh, uh, standard economic models of economics, standard models of economics, you do have uh, uh, this signaling effect. That is something that, in theory, you can have. There I will be brief. The paper has more uh, detail on it. And then the second thing that is very important is about uh, using the insights from the model to test this theory, to show you how in Japan, when uh, you have this controlled experiment, where you have a control group that fiscal policy is not linked to any negative outlook, and you have a treatment group where you have some instances of fiscal policy that are linked to something that happened in the economy and, and can give you some signal, our econometric tools, they show clearly that the signaling effect is there. And how the signaling effect is not linked to policy per se. It's not just the fact that um, uh, policy is geared towards stimulating the economy, but the signaling effect is there when there is uncertainty. And uncertainty, like in times of war, is the key feature. And, and then we will look at the, how important is this channel, uh, to what extent, uh, what is the reaction of stock prices, for instance, to uncertainty, and then I will conclude. So here, when we are thinking about uh, uh, um, the, the, this issue, how would we model it as economists? So this issue is tricky, because to think about this issue in a formal way, we need to have a model where there is imperfect information where agents, they see the economy, but they don't see exactly how the economy uh, uh, evolves. They, they have a notion that GDP moves. There is this variable of GDP that moves, but they don't observe it clearly. There are uh, revisions to GDP, so the underlying true GDP is not known by the government, but the government needs to form expectations about it to then have policy that if GDP seems to be falling, policy that resurrects this, this variable of GDP. So we need model with imperfect informations, and we need model where the government has potentially some advantage. The government can observe uh, 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 GDP with some uh, um, um, uh, error, the underlying uh, through GDP, but it has also uh, uh, some tools that, such that it can have some information that the private agents, uh, they don't see. They don't, they, they, the private agents, typically, they don't have sophisticated forecasting. Households, they, they, they form views, whereas the government can really uh, uh, access to data that the private agents they don't need. So we need a model where we have imperfect information, but also asymmetric information. And then, in this model, we need to have that fiscal policy is counter-cyclical. And that is critical because if fiscal policy must increase when output goes down. And finally, we need to have that the 
uh, expectations are relevant for the state of the economy that if agents see this government spending that goes up and demand goes up, nonetheless, if they have negative expectations, they will start spending less to prepare for the hard time ahead and therefore output will fall. So we need a model with these four ingredients. And here I have the simplest model that you can have which gives us these ingredients. So you can think that the economy, there is GDP, that is this variable X that everybody wants to know, but X is, 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 is not fully observable. But X responds uh, uh, positively to some fiscal spending, G, government spending. And so if government spending goes up, X goes up. But also, uh, uh, GDP depends on the expectations of the agents. So those are uh, 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 E, uh, 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 that variable uh, E uh, in brackets, the expectation of GDP given the information of the private sector. So here you can think that GDP depends on two things, on government spending and on private expectations. And plus there is an error, something that uh, unsystematically uh, makes GDP moves that, that is not due to the government intervention and is not due to the expectations of the private sector. So this is a very simple model. It tells you if the government spend, output goes up. If the expectations of the agents are good, output goes up. And the policy function is how does government spending happen here? Well, government spending is a government spends money in reaction to the expectation that the government has about GDP. If GDP goes up, then the government decreases spending. If GDP goes down, the government increases spending, and that is captured by this parameter C that is negative. That is the counter-cyclical monetary policy. So the idea here is very simple. You have a model, the government can push up uh, uh, output, or the private sector uh, can push up output through the expectations. What is important is that the government needs to form expectations about the state of the economy, about how GDP will be. And uh, those expectations are based on what the government observes, what the government observes of output, plus there is a, a signal, a noise, in what the government can do. They do a forecast, but there is always an error in it. Finally, the, the agents, they form these expectations by receiving a, pub, a, a private sig a signal on how the economy looks like with an error. So now we, we, we have that these agents they receive a signal on how the economy is doing. At the same time, what the agents do, they can also, they know the forecast of the government, what the government thinks about the economy. And that can be revealing on, a, 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 on the underlying state of the economy. So if the, if the agents basically, they receive this signal, but they also observe the action of the government that reveals the expectations that the government has about the economy. So basically now, what the agents have, they can, in their information set, look at the private spending, at, at the government spending, and that will reveal what the government think about GDP. Or, and they also receive a signal that everybody receives about the state of the economy. Now, you, you, now we, we, we are in a world where in this simple model, government can tell you, can give you extra information on how output uh, 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 looks like in the future from the forecast of the government. And that is the signaling effect. And the signaling happens when this parameter is different from zero. If I set this parameter from equal to zero, it means that the government set public spending without looking, without being influenced by the state of the economy. Now, all this uh, first part of the paper is to show you that in this simple model, we have uh, uh, signaling effects. We have uh, the following. 
So when, when uh, uh, here, I think that probably what I will do here, I will skip those technical details and go to the intuition. So the intuition here, from this simple model, we get four effects. First, that the policy actions, if they are exogenous, if they are not linked to the state of the economy, then there is no signaling effect. So if the, go if the agents know that that parameter C is equal to zero, if here, in this parameter, this is equal to zero, then the, 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 what the government announced is totally unrelated with the state of the economy, there is no signaling. And so the expectations, then the, the agents, if there is no signaling, then uh, the, 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 this negative effect in the economy is not there. That's what the model tells us. To have the signaling effect, you have that the agents know that policy is counter-cyclical, and it depends on the expectations of the government on how the economy, GDP, will look like. Then we have signaling. Then, what this model tells us is that the more uncertainty the private agents have about the state of the economy, the more, in this simple model, this signal is noisy. This is a public signal that everybody knows about the state of the economy. The more noisy it is, then the more the government will, the more the uh, private sector will depend on, on uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, signaling of fiscal policy to know how the economy will be doing. So if you have a signal that is very noisy, if you don't know where GDP will be in the next period, suddenly uncertainty goes up today, then you take this information from the government. The government becomes even more important because the uncertainty that you face about uh, your own uh, beliefs is so high that you say, maybe the government can give me this uh, signal that I don't have. And then the signaling effect becomes important. The final point is that if the policy is sufficiently strong to stabilize output, the signaling effect weakens. Despite you have a lot of uncertainty, if the counter-cyclical uh, response of output, if, if, the, if, if you have a big push in public spending, that counteracts the fiscal stimulus. So the idea of this simple model is to just show that to have signaling effect, you need that policy is linked with the state of the economy. You need that there is a lot of uncertainty, that you, you are unable to read the, the, the economy, to, to tell by yourself where the economy will be, and so you rely a lot on the government. But when you do that, you know that the government only increases spending if the economy is tanking. And so that creates this signaling effect, that despite the government increases uh, public spending, your expectations become bleak, and uh, you tend to spend less. So from one side, you have that the government pushes it up. From the other side, you instead, you say, well, precisely because they do it, it's going to be, diff it's, it's gonna be hard time I had. It's better that I don't spend much today. And that erodes the effectiveness of fiscal policy. Then what we do in the paper, we, we, we look in a, in, a, in a model that is more uh, micro-founded based on standard theory, and we see is this theory reliable? Will the model based on this theory generate sizable effect of, of, uh, of, of, of uh, um, uh, sig uh, a sizable signaling effect? And here what we do, we play with the uh, uncertainty parameters, the variance of, of the noise, and we look on how the stock market, the response of the stock market changes to uh, a 5% increase in, increase in fiscal policy when uncertainty goes up. And you see that we start, uh, we, we can look at stock market or output. If we look at the stock prices, for instance, we start that they are positive, but then when uncertainty increases, 
then is when the private sector and the agents, they start looking at the government to see whether they can extract information from their action. So if uncertainty is very large and you have an increase of 5% in government spending, you think, wow, it means that things are going badly. And so the stock market, the response of the stock market decreases as uncertainty goes up and potentially can become negative. So this is the theory. There is nothing here that says that's what happened in reality. We build a little model that was a laboratory, something that out in our mind, we felt it made sense. We formalized it on a piece of paper, a lot of paper, a lot of pencils. You get the solution of the model, go to MATLAB, simulate it, but there is nothing that says this makes sense. So the next thing is to say, let's go to the data. Let's test it. Here we have predictions. Theory tells us, look, if you want to test it, you need to have fiscal policy that is related to the future state of the economy. Theory tells us, if you want to see strong uh, uh, signaling effect, you need to have an uncertain times. So now what we did in the next part of this journey we said, OK, uh, let's go and let's look for some data that they have this, uh, this feature. Basically, what we want to do now in our test is to tear apart the fact that in any announcement of a fiscal stimulus plan, you can have two components. One is the standard expansionary component, and the other one is the contractionary effects related to the signaling effect that in this model is related to a fall in productivity, but you can think about to a fall in GDP. And so, in order to do it, we uh, went to Japan. Japan was a brilliant example. I'm, I'm, I feel sorry to say brilliant, because underneath it there are natural disasters, people dying, losing homes, and, 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 and that's a, it's, it's, it's very unsettling on, on some extent. On, on, on the other hand, for this project, is great, because then we can think, if we want to devise policy that helps the economy to recover, the fact that the economy is geared to counteract this natural disaster, is this something that is important, that as policymakers, should we know and care about it? Should we think about issues and how to circumvent those issues? So what we did, we have that in Japan, you have uh, 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 in this period, 2011, 2020, you have a period that we have many natural disasters, earthquakes, uh, um, uh, nuclear plants, that they have some issues and, and, and uh, unfortunately uh, they, they have to shut down abruptly. And, and, uh, and, 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 so, and, and then the government needs to step in. And the government in, in this period, uh, uh, it makes, and in Japan is a nice example, because in, a, in, a, in some countries when something like that happens, it becomes very shambolic. You have someone makes announcement, then they revert it. Uh, in Japan, they are actually very organized. Probably they have the experience that uh, helps them a lot. And what happens is that when you have this natural disaster, the government uh, 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 gets together and uh, uh, delegates uh, 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 um, a commission to think about what could be a good plan in order to overcome those natural disasters. And then, what is critical is that once this commission gives a recommendation, there is a public press release that the prime minister says, OK, now we are going to do this uh, uh, fiscal package. And uh, this fiscal package is of this size. And then the public knows about it. But that is, for, for our experiment, is exactly what we want. We want that something bad happen. Agents know that any fiscal policy is not to stimulate the economy to increase education because it's good. No, it's because something happens. So there could be some signal that there is a damage. Nobody knows typically about this damage. Like during the pandemic, they found a, a boat that it had uh, some people that they were sick. So they shut down the country. They shut down everything. Suddenly, nobody knew what was the size uh, of, of the contagion. But that had a, potentially had a huge effect on how the economy would, would, would react. 
And, and then, so what we do, we, we basically look at, at those uh, announcements and we look uh, on uh, their impact on stock prices. And here we have 16 supplementary fiscal announcements that the government did between 2011 and 2020. And uh, we have timing of the news releases uh, from reading of the Nikkei newspaper. This is the, the, the biggest newspaper in Japan, the one that uh, 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 the uh, investors and the public uh, uh, reads and the news used to uh, uh, um, make uh, uh, news. And uh, um, the, the good thing is that uh, in each of these announcements, you have that uh, at one day, in what time of the day, the Prime Minister says, declares the size of the fiscal package. And then what we look is how the stock market reacts to it. Now, the important thing when you do this stuff is to say, okay, now we, we can estimate that, but what would be the counterfactual? How would be the word, what would be the effect of policy if we didn't have this uh, 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 potentially signaling effect? And so, here, uh, uh, what, what, what we do is also to um, have a control uh, um, uh, estimation where we also look at fiscal expansion that was not uh, aimed to uh, counteract uh, natural disasters. Those are experiments like when fiscal policy is totally exogenous to the state of the economy, like when, for instance, Japan won the bid for the Olympics. Japan won the bid of the Olympics, then the Prime Minister went public and said, now we increase public spending. And because we need to uh, modernize Japan, we need to do some infrastructure, build stadium, then we can have a feeling. Those are a totally exogenous event. And when they, they won the Expo, similar. So what we did in this project was to have a control group where we have this uh, potential signal channel, and instead a group where uh, 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 we, we, uh, uh, sorry, we, we, sorry, we have a treatment group where we have this uh, uh, channel in place and a control group where we don't have this channel in place and then we can compare the two and see how different uh, uh, they are. So here you, you, you just have what I said about the phases of the announcement where the Prime Minister instructs the Cabinet, first phase. The second phase, which is the one that we will use, is critical, is that there is a public discussion and the Prime Minister announced the size of those fiscal packages. And then there is a third phase, which is the ratification. So part of this project was also to show that what really matters to quantify the signaling effect is when these packages are first announced. The ratification and the discussion where people are uncertain about it does not matter. So here, just for the account, you have, uh, uh, for each of these packages, you have the, f the, the uh, uh, when was uh, uh, the size of those packages announced. And, and you have the dates and what happened. But mainly, it, uh, those are related to natural disasters like earthquake or nuclear disasters, reconstruction. Some of them are related to abenomics. And uh, also, uh, some of them, are actually the, the strongest one, they are related with COVID, when uncertainty, as I will show you, was very high. So, as I said, we will have now, the, our experiment will, in, will, uh, um, uh, uh, will be of uh, testing this theory on two groups. One is our control group. Those are the exogenous announcement when there is no uh, risk of signaling. Those are the Olympics. The other one is the signaling, uh, which is the treatment group, where uh, uh, fiscal policy is endogenous and it may convey information about the future of the economy. And for us, what we want really to do in this experiment is to show you that the signaling channel is there and is predominant when there is uncertainty. If there is no uncertainty, even if policy is geared towards helping the economy, the signaling channel is minimal. So here are the two uh, uh, groups. So those are, uh, on, on, on your left, are the um, exogenous fiscal spending. Those are the general election, the Tokyo Olympics, and the Osaka Expo. 
as you see here, what we show is the response of stock prices in uh, the three days after the announcement. So in, in the period uh, uh, between zero and one, at the, this is the first day. At that point, the announcement was made. And you see that at the end of the day, the stock market unequivocally goes up. And it goes up in the next three consecutive days. And the red line is the average. So on average, you see that fiscal policy is what we studied in, in textbooks. The government goes there, it says, uh, I do public spending, I'm going to build roads, I'm going to do new stadium. Uh, bang, the stock market goes up. And the stock market summarizes a bit uh, what investors, what uh, 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 the, the, the public takes out of those announcements. On the right hand side, you have these 16 supplementary budgets. Those are the days, the bleak days, when the prime minister goes in face of the, uh, uh, of the nation and says, we are doing fiscal spending, we are this earthquake, um, and this is the size. What you see is that, in general, the sign on, on these curves tells you whether on the first day the reaction of the stock price was positive or negative. In general, you see two things that, first, the, re the magnitude is, is much smaller. Typically, it can be also in the negative territory, but on average, is around zero. So the point of this research is not to say that the signaling effect makes the reaction negative. It's to say that instead of being a clear positive reaction to public spending, it is less positive. Fiscal policy becomes less effective. In times of uncertainty, this channel of expectations makes fiscal policy less effective. So that is, is, uh, is, uh, is something that already gives you a feeling on, uh, on, uh, on the fact that there, there could be a signaling uh, a channel of, 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 of fiscal policy. But then, from here, you cannot tell what is driving it, why in some instances is higher the reaction is higher and positive in some is lower. And in the next part of this talk, what I'm going to show you in a, in a few slides is that that is related to the degree of uncertainty. Those lines that they become very negative is when uncertainty is very large. Those are periods when the public is really uncertain and takes the signal from the government, this public spending, as indicating a bleak outlook. The fact that there was an earthquake is not an issue. The issue is, is that when there is a lot of uncertainty. If there was an earthquake, but people say they don't have much uncertainty because maybe the earthquake wasn't so bleak, wasn't so big, was very contained. The package is huge, but the earthquake uh, was very contained. The signaling effect is not there. The signaling effect really needs uncertainty to bite. And so, here in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, in these slides, what I want to show you is that uh, uncertainty now is the key feature to think about signaling effect. And how do we quantify uncertainty? So here it is tricky. And, and in the first set of slides, what I want to show you is that you can think of uncertainty that comes out from surveys of people or firms. If you ask firms, what do you think about the future? Or if you ask households, what do you think about the future? What do you think about asset prices? then you can do a cross-sectional dispersion of views. And these graphs, they show you that they, they plot this cross, the cross-sectional dispersion of view, the variance of what people think through the lenses of, of those surveys. Those are surveys that they say, what do you think about asset prices? Do they go up, down? Do they stay the same? Do they go slightly up or slightly down? And if you do the dispersion in any point of time, what you see is that when you have a lot of dispersion, when people think, oh, it goes up, someone says it goes down, then you have a lot of dispersion. Typically, is when the effect of the announcement of stock prices is negative. And those minus signs, they are meant to tell you how the stock prices reacted to those announcements. And so here is just to build up in your mind the idea that Uncertainty is really critical for this, uh, uh, for this, and confidence that agents have is really critical. Now, those are survey data, and here I have uh, some others based on those is firms. The Takan survey is a 
f uh, is based on firms' conditions, but you see that even for firms, when, an, when the, the cross-sectional dispersion of views is large, firms have different views, there is a lot of uncertainty, depending on who you ask, you get a different answer, is when the stock market falls, when there are those announcements. Now, those are quarterly series or monthly series, but to capture these uh, effects, uh, you want series that are uh, eye-moving, daily series. So what I did here was to show you that those views, those views uh, from the surveys, they are well captured by the Nikkei index, which is a daily measure about the stock price. That they are highly correlated, they co-move together, so in my estimation, in my last slide, that I'll show you uh, in, in a couple of minutes, uh, I will use this Nikkei index because this Nikkei index, the, how the stock price moves, uh, correlates highly on how uh, uh, people form expectations on, on, on the cross-sectional dispersion of expectations of, 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 of firms and households. And even if you look at this index, you see that when uncertainty goes up, those announcements, they tend to be uh, a negative effect on stock prices. So here is the final uh, 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 slide. For, uh, uh, I have a couple of more, but uh, uh, this is, in this slide, what I do is do a regression where I look the change in the stock price at different horizons, in one quarter I had, two quarters I had, and now, this change on stock price depends on the announcement, on the final size of the package, when the Prime Minister goes out there and, and tells the public. And now, also, it interacts with the uncertainty index. So what, what this theory tells us, the way in which we test the theory is the following. If this theory is correct, we would expect that when this is large, and there is the announcement when uncertainty is large and there is an announcement, this becomes positive, negative and significant. So this beta H is negative and significant, that having an announcement in period of uncertainty is significantly decrease the change in the stock price. And that's what we do, and that's what we find. We find that this term is actually negative the announcement alone doesn't have a, a significant effect on, on, on the stock price. But it does, and negatively, when there is uncertainty. And so this is summarizes a bit your lecture. Your lecture was about the government, when it uses fiscal policy to counteract uh, uh, downturns, can also provide uh, signal on uh, what it thinks about the outlook. Those signals are important when the public uh, is not confident, there is a lot of uncertainty, then it uses fiscal policy to extract information that it cannot extract by looking at the economy because there is a lot of uncertainty. And so fiscal policy in those times becomes less effective. Here we have the response of stock prices. If we, we haven't done it yet, but if you look at output, probably would have a similar uh, 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 negative effect on output. And we do a series of robustness check. We, we check, for instance, uh, whether the other announcements are important. When the Prime Minister forms this commission, orders someone to look into the issue, uh, whether that is important and it's not, is not significant. Or uh, uh, when there is the ratification, when everything has been announced and, 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 um, and the Parliament ratifies uh, 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 the package. No, what it really matters is when this information is released, because that resolves uncertainty in the mind of the public. The public says, oh, I'm very uncertain, but now the government reduces my uncertainty by giving, you, giving me the signal about fiscal policy, but I know that the fiscal package is large, it means that it's, a bad, for the, it's bad for the economy, and that's what generates the signaling effect. So when we plot it, and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll conclude, here we have for each of the announcements, starting in uh, 2011, 
ending in uh, uh, 2020, we have what is the level of uncertainty. This is the uh, uncertainty index. If it's positive, it means that uncertainty is above average. If it is negative, it means that uncertainty is below average. So what this graph tells us is that when uncertainty is above average, this is, we have a, no, a, a positive number, the response of stock prices tends to be less positive or even negative. So in this case, it's negative. This was when there was a, one of the biggest earthquakes in Japan in 2011. So we see that signaling effect can be there, but it's only there prominently when uncertainty is large. So those red, uh, red uh, uh, um, 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 captions are meant to tell that the stock prices contracts or uh, doesn't expand because there is uncertainty. If we look at the COVID, so here it, they are in chronological order. If we go to the COVID period, we see that the contraction actually is quite large. And the reason is because look at the uncertainty. Very high. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude by saying the following, that fiscal policy typically is expansionary, and it's good. But fiscal policy also contains ele an element of uh, uh, information about the bleak future ahead, especially when fiscal policy is done to counteract uh, 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 negative events in the economy. And uh, this signaling effect, what I call signaling effect, is uh, negative uh, news about uh, a positive fiscal expansion is high when uncertainty is large. If uncertainty is not large, then it plays a minimal role. And what we did in this project, we developed a simple model that gave us uh, some testable predictions. It shows us that it's not cuckoo land. It's not something that, yeah, you cook up. It's a yeah, model of theory will give you this, this result. And when we take this theory seriously to the data, we find it. And the key to find it, to detect it, is uncertainty. In normal times, this is not an issue. But so the open question then for so policymakers is uh, how to fine-tune fiscal policy in times of war when uncertainty is high. And that is still open. Because on one side, you have to intervene. On the other side, your action is enacted by the fact that there is a lot of uncertainty and you give signal uh, to agents. And with that, I conclude, and uh, uh, I think we will have uh, some discussion ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I think we move yes, over here. I, I sit here. <laughs> yeah, uh, let me say hello from my side and welcome you to the second part of uh, this event, which is uh, which I have the honor to moderate. So uh, we will be opening up uh, the, uh, to a general discussion with the audience. Maybe I uh, misuse or <laughs> use my position a little bit to start uh, chatting with you uh, first, Francesco. Uh, but actually, before we go into the contents, um, uh, I should probably um, um, get rid of the um, form formal stuff or the information I should convey. So, as I said, there will be questions from the audience. Uh, there will be someone uh, going through with the microphone afterwards. Uh, and I should also announce that there are foods and drinks in ceremonial hall two after the event, so to give you another incentive to stay. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, I think we sit down, right? <laughs> okay, let's sit down. We make uh, it um, yeah, ourselves comfortable. Yeah, so let me maybe start by thanking you for a <clears throat> really inspiring talk, and uh, I think uh, that uh, it couldn't be more uh, up to date, and um, the research that we need uh, in these uh, times of uncertainty. Uh, that are here to stay, it seems. Um, and maybe, <clears throat> maybe let me start by, so what was really great for me is that, um, so you took a super neat example from um, 
uh, Japan and on these um, stock market um, reactions. But of course, the overall message is much bigger than that and is really a macro uh, question or, or topic. And um, as you said, it uh, uh, has direct implications on how, <clears throat> how large fiscal multipliers are actually are in certain states of the uh, economy, in particular in times of high uncertainty. And um, so you could also, if I as a macroeconomist would frame it, I would say that um, uh, the crowding out effects of the government or the public se uh, sector spending are um, dependent on this state of uncertainty and they are likely to be much larger um, because of the signal signaling effect. So firms will stop investing or in, Households uh, will not shop but save uh, for the bad times that are revealed by the uh, government. <clears throat> and um, so that's exciting research, maybe uh, one word. So you had a slide on uh, the monetary uh, policy literature that mm -hmm. on, on these um, signaling effects, which is large. And um, so maybe let me talk a little bit about that and also I guess we should look there because we should ask what can we actually learn from that literature that is already there. Um, yeah, so the, <clears throat> obviously the, the monetary policy literature is quite undiscussed that the central bank has superior knowledge. I mean, they, all they do is uh, track inflation, they employ uh, PhD economists, they watch the economy. Um, so they definitely have a, a super superior knowledge over the general public. Uh, I guess it's also reasonable that the government has superior knowledge, um, but probably to a lesser degree than um, central banks on, on the state of economy. They are hit by all tons of crises, COVID, um, uh, natural disasters. They have to be experts on everything. Um, so... In a way, how, how big is this um, uh, information advantage that is actually revealed? Um, and, but maybe more important, what can we learn from the monetary policy literature? So the implication there is actually we should uh, lower this information asymmetry. So all yeah. what central banks do is after every uh, uh, poly monetary policy uh, meeting, they release minutes, they talk to the general public, um, um, explaining their plan and how they see the world. So should the government do something similar to lower the asymmetry? I think that could be, or that would be a conclusion taken from this other field maybe. Um, yeah, so this would be interesting questions. I, I guess the answer yeah. cannot be that the government should not react <laughs> to so, such. So I think for, so for the first one, yeah. I think that in, in this project, what we found is, is that it's not necessarily that the government has some superior information mm -hmm. that is more precise, but the government has some different information. Mm -hmm. The government forms expectations, and those expectations are different from uh, what the private sector uh, already knows about the signal of the economy. And, and See, precisely because they are different from the private signal, they can convey some additional no redundant information to uh, the private sector. So for us, it's not really that the government has a superior information, it's that it has different. It maybe makes different errors, it, does a, it has a different model in mind, mm -hmm. but it becomes informative. And the content of information becomes more and more uh, precious when you have high uncertainty. When you you need to form your own expectations, but you have a lot of uncertainty in the economy, so you, 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 you can't really have precise expectations, but then you have this additional information from someone else that is different from you that you can use. But you know that someone else is going to do certain actions, increase G, only if uh, 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 GDP goes down. But so the, the, what we have compared to the, uh, the, uh, some type of literature of monetary policy that was more about the Federal Reserve has better information than the private sector, so it can use it strategically. The private sector knows that, and that creates signaling. For us, it's more the government is not superior in any way, it's different. Mm -hmm. 
And so that, that I think for us was quite important because it was more general. Now, what can the government do to mitigate this? That is the big question. Is there any way in which the government can communicate differently? And that is difficult because to break, so the theory tells us, well, easy. To break the signaling effect, you need to tear apart the relationship between the policy action and the state of the economy. But that is the essence of fiscal policy. Fiscal policy get voted, and people in Parliament spend a lot of time to think about it, especially because it's the, one of the few policy tools that can help against natural disasters. With, fisc with monetary policy, we can talk about inflation and, and other sources. With, monetary, with fiscal policy, we can't, so that is difficult. It, it, can you envisage a world where you take out this signaling effect by simply saying policy is unrelated to what happens to the economy? That, that is difficult. And so in this line of research, we haven't tackled it yet. That is how we end uh, uh, the paper, saying next stage is to think about is there any way in which government can actually alleviate uh, uh, these, uh, these uh, maybe in, they can have some com different way in which they communicate that they can be contingency con can be, mm. but that is something that needs to be investigated so I don't have an, uh, an answer in terms of another point that you made about uh, um, uh, uh, the, uh, how the signaling effect how the, fiscal, how the signaling effect affect the fiscal multiplier here, in previous research, the, real, the, the effect was how policy crowds out. That if the government spends money, then it, it, it makes it, uh, it competes with the private sector to buy goods, you can think, and prices go up. So if you increase demand, prices go up. If the government increases demand, prices go up. If the government builds bridges, the material to build, to build those bridges, the price will go up. And that is the crowding out. By, going, by this price going up, it crowds out private investment. The government does it, but the private sector doesn't do it because now it's more costly because the government is done it. The crowding out effect that we have here is radically it's different. Good. It's based on expectations. There is nothing about scarcity and the government going there and spending money and raising prices and alienating private investors. Here it's all about expectations. The government gives you a signal you are like, I'm gonna mill. Here the economy is gonna tank. I'm gonna wait to spend because I don't know. There is this uncertainty. And so it's a completely different channel that generates uh, um, what they, in, in Jericho, they call the uh, state dependent fiscal multiplier, that they change the effectiveness of fiscal spending. Uh, but it's through an expectation channel that is, is, uh, is something more tenuous difficult to detect than objectively looks like what is the demand compared to the supply. If the demand goes up, prices goes up, then we will have the people spend less money because it's more costly. And so that, that is why it's tricky. And the trickiness is also that the signaling effect uh, is not necessarily that is negative. It makes policy less positive and so it's more difficult to detect it. You see an expansion in fiscal policy, the stock price goes up, but not much. Eh, what part is signaling? What part instead is a natural reaction of the economy? That was why we had this experiment in the uh, uh, control and treatment group. Yeah, um, I mean, in times of uncertainty, of course, the government's information itself about the state of the economy is also affected. So it's not uh, so. In actually, in your model, when varying this increase in the size of uncertainty parameter, did that uh, apply to everyone or to the private sector? Uh, because, main, mainly, mm -hmm. it, it is critical that applies to the signal of the private sector, mm -hmm. what the, the, the agents observes to the fundamental, how the fundamentals of the economy, they become more uncertain. If so if also the government actually uh, has a lot of noise in a, or is unable to forecast very well, then the signaling effect sort of disappear because the agents know that also the government uh, cannot do very good forecasts, so the expectations exactly. are not very good, and so that uh, uh, detracts the information that the government can convey 
by the action of policy. If I know that you know, this policy action, it has a lot of uncertainty as well because the government expectations are totally imprecise, then becomes not informative for me as well. That is another angle that we discuss in the paper, precisely as you said. Yeah, let me maybe uh, look into the audience and uh, take questions from the audience. As I said, I do not want to monopolize here. <laughs> in the 1990s, there was a bubble crash in Japan, I think. And can we use this model in these times of uncertainty <coughs> or not? So you can do it. So the issue that we had in Japan was also about the data. Uh, how far we can go with these uh, uh, announcements and how was the framework consistent? So in the 90s, I think we also face the issue of not having data, for instance, on expectations. I think probably the TACAN survey goes back to the 90s, but the other surveys, they don't. So that's why we limited. One of the, of, of the challenges that we are facing now in order to put the working paper out is precisely to go back and see also those, uh, those longer view on, 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 on how it looks like. Because in the results that I showed you, most of the negative actions comes from the COVID period. What we want to show is that that applies also earlier on. But right now we, 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 we are still collecting the data and see whether the data is consistent in order to do this uh, extension. Uh, all right, thank you for the talk. It was super interesting. This is the first time that I actually um, got into contact with the signaling stuff, so it was very new to me. Um, so the way I understood it, the key part of the signaling effect is that the information set of the government is different to the one of the private sector. So maybe in terms of policy implications, maybe one of them would be to kind of try to consolidate these two information sets and maybe that the government communicates the model it has or um, communicates in times of crisis um, um, what information set it has. So, yeah, maybe. I totally endorse it. But <clears throat> sometimes this information is difficult to be shared. Imagine now there is a war between uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, imagine there is a war now between Ukraine and, and Russia, and uh, you are the prime minister of France, and you need to design a package, and you have uh, you know what happened. You have maybe some information. Would you be able to release this information? Would that would you feel releasing it? Because maybe also you don't know, you, you, you have this intelligence that, you know, things are developing, uh, there are some issues at the border, and that is uh, affecting some supply chains. Do you, can you do it? If you can do it, then I agree that if you can consolidate the information set, then you would uh, wipe out any signaling. But is it in your own interest to do it? In times of uncertainty, I don't know. But that would be a good way to think about how to neutralize uh, these uh, detracting uh, contribution of signaling to an expansionary fiscal package. That, that would be a very clever way, very tricky though. And as I said, I think in the end it will boil down how we communicate. Maybe we, we can, uh, another way would be to counteract these negative expectations with some other communication devices. But I think there we will probably need more uh, research. I mean, maybe following up, so when I think of COVID, that would be more an example where uh, the government could have um, shared the, their view or information with the public. And uh, I mean, you could say that formally this was um, going on. So there were always, of course, uh, statements by the government with, any, with every action. But the deepness of um, these communications um, was typically not, <laughs> yeah, was not very deep. So in also, it is intrinsic that uh, nowadays governments are very open. And I think it's very, in very, it's very rare that government conceal information. But it is intrinsic in what happens is that when there is uncertainty, they don't even know 
and the public may attribute knowledge that is not there. And so it is by construction, by default, by human nature, that you can have this channel at work in times of high uncertainty, even with the best intentions. I think that, you know, if I look back at Europe, what happened in, in my country, in the UK, what happens here in the continent, the government had, had the best intentions, but the world, when the world becomes uncertain, you can read the out of action things that maybe are not there, but you act on it. And that creates, if your expectations are important on what happened today, acting on those expectations generates the outcome of today. And so that are, is tricky. Thank you very much. A question on, did you control the time lapse between the natural disaster and the announcement of the uh, policy action? Because I would expect that the stock markets primarily react to the natural disaster and not so much to the, uh, to the policy reaction uh, before I came to that lecture. So um, were those, the, those, those packages announced immediately on the day or the second day or the third day after the natural disaster? Because then there is certainly, uh, I mean, there's a link then, obviously. Or were those packages announced a week later, etc.? That would be my first question. The second one is more of a remark. I mean, in times of uncertainty, governments usually uh, announce packages that are a whatever it takes package. So they just announce packages that are probably way too big. And I work for the uh, Ministry of Finance, so I have a, a certain you know, uh, <laughs> knowledge about what the policy or what the politicians do. So they have an incentive to announce a package that is big, that is, has to be big. Look at what happened to, uh, during COVID. So it's probably, uh, and we, we see that in the data, uh, the money is not used that is usually announced. So um, that is also something that probably is a good advice, uh, uh, that, the, that the policy should be fine-tuned and uh, the uh, um, policymakers should better think about it, but it's just, a, the, it's just built into the system of expectations. A politician has an incentive to announce a package that is as big as it is can, uh, it can get, uh, at least at these uh, times. Huh? Thank you. So those are very uh, good questions. So the, one of the tricky bit with this line of research is that when you are talking about fiscal policy, it is less structured than monetary policy. So in monetary policy, in a way, it is easier to study things because you have meetings that are at certain time, uh, at certain time of the day, uh, uh, within a time framework that is narrow, agents are very prepared. Fiscal policy is not like that. Fiscal policy, even the normal fiscal policy can happen on a Tuesday, on a Wednesday. Um, in, in Japan, uh, there were announcements, there is the, the, the time in the paper, but the, some they were like uh, 9 a.m., others 5 p.m. So that, that it is tricky. And typically, the announcement it wasn't uh, um, the, in the next day after the disaster. It will take some time because that is the second phase. In the first, so the disaster happened, the first phase, the prime minister say there is this commission of wise men that they need to think about the issue. And then the second phase, so here uh, it will take some days before it happens, but the interesting things that you can think, oh, now people will prepare. So they will, uh, you know, they, those expectations, they will, there will be little reaction because they know, they will hear about something and they will form expectations. But still, the second announcement was significant and it had a significant impact. That tells me that it is really when the news is released, when agents know the size or they have a view of the size, that that is, 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 uh, is when uh, you, is important and has the signaling component. There is a signaling component related to it. The fact that they want to overdo uh, can be an issue that can bias, so your, your point is that maybe can bias uh, the results because uh, that could be, but agents, if, if you systematically overdo it, then agents should discount it. The signaling effect should, should, should go down, instead it still goes up. So I think that in a way, uh, I was surprised as you were to see that it is significant after a, a few days when people already know it's, it's, it's going to be a big disaster. Uh, uh, and to me, that was uh, uh, why I felt excited. I think, 
Yeah, we have another. Building on top of that, yes. But there's still um, a source of information that you have not um, exploited in here, which is the fact that the government would have press releases or via text mining or via uh, information gathering in terms of the, the narratives of those announcements, basically the same way as monetary policy, the monetary policy communication literature is doing to try to have a look at whether anticipation modulates those signaling so effects. The, you, you, we have a final section in the paper where we want to do is to control for the forecast, for the anticipation of, of the agents. And, we haven't fully done it yet, but this is on our agenda to show that even if you control for this amplification, even if you clean uh, 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 the, the estimation from the fact that there is some anticipation effect to test whether the signaling is still there. Yeah. I, I, I agree that is central and that is something that uh, we are doing as we speak. Um, how do you how do you plan to uh, measure the anticipate, anticipation that you've been speaking about? Because I've been wondering exactly that. I thought that this is uh, would be more meaningful if we could control for the anticipation. So I'm, I'm, but I thought it would be impossible to measure that in any sensible way. The, the can you uh, 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 the uh, anticipation? How how. Do, how do you want to measure the anticipation the anti so, in order to compare the anticipation yeah. now with the, at another point in time? The, the, the way that we are thinking of devising this is uh, the anticipation will be uh, in the forecast or in the forecast error. Uh, if you have a forecast of uh, how things will look like, then you, you can control on what agents anticipate about the economy. So ex ante, before the announcement, was there any anticipation that the agents have? And uh, if we can control for it, we can have an estimation cleaned by this anticipation effect. Are we capturing, in other uh, way, the question was, you call it signaling effect, but this is part of the anticipation. You need to take care of that. And the way in which you could do it is to look at a forecast before the announcement and see whether uh, when you control for the forecast, you still have the signaling effect, that you are uh, doing an estimation where this uh, 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 ex-ante feeling that you had about the economy is not part uh, of your uh, signaling effect. And that, I think, is critical and it's something that we, we, we are planning to do. Yeah, so in terms of uh, designing uh, or as, a, as the government designing these packages, um, maybe uh, it should look at the spread of uh, or consumer confidence uh, like you did in, um, in, in guessing how, how big this uh, signaling effect will actually diminish its actions. I mean, that... Or, yeah. I, I think it will be probably for, for so a policy. So and then go for a smaller uh, package on the benefit of... So one dimension that we haven't really leverage, uh, um, uh, leveraged in this uh, uh, research is to see uh, if you... So you can be disappointed on the upside or on the downside. Maybe you expected a lower package or an higher package. Is it something relevant? And there we, it will be interesting to have some data where you can look uh, uh, whether a, a downside or an upside disappointment makes any difference. Whether the, you, the, you, you can have expectations that are not met or they can exceed, mm -hmm. uh, that they are not met or they exceed your expectations. Mm -hmm. That could be an interesting dimension, but you need data 
where you can look at what people felt and whether uh, uh, they were disappointed or not. The, and the issue with those is that, as I showed, is that those expectations typically they are quarterly or they are monthly. Instead, to do this exercise, you need something much uh, uh, at higher frequency, something at daily. And, and we haven't found that, but if you have a proxy for that, I think that could be very interesting and it would be down the road of answering this interesting question. Mm. Yeah, in particular, this uh, text mining of newspaper articles is what comes to mind. That could be one, yes. And looking for the keywords of what people think. Mm. Yeah, okay, we are pretty much on time, but we would have, no, we, we have time for another question. Thank you very much for the interesting uh, presentation. Okay. So one question that I would have is uh, how you know the counterfactual. So for example, if there is a pandemic and say it would on net uh, reduce per capita GDP by 10% and then you make a fiscal policy, you increase uh, uh, your expenditure, say, by 1% of GDP, and then say the net effect is that uh, GDP per capita is only reduced by 5 percentage points. Yeah. So then uh, the multiplier effect would be 5, although the effect is negative, right? And with the um, Olympics, you could have, for example, the effect that on net it would increase per capita GDP by 1 percentage point, and you have an additional expansionary fiscal policy by 1 percent, then the, uh, the multiplier would only be 2, uh, so it would be rather low, right? Although, on, uh, so it is higher than the, than the starting point. So could you, uh, how can these two be, uh, yeah? So the, 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 your exercise will be uh, how the pandemic without intervention will be compared to the pandemic with intervention. Uh, so our exercise was different. Our exercise was uh, between uh, 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 no signaling and signaling. So that, that experiment uh, um, will, will require a different analysis in the sense that there is not about uh, uh, signaling effect or is loosely about signaling effect, but is more about counterfactual. What would have happened if we didn't have uh, any, any effect? That, that, that we haven't looked at it will be something interesting. If we do a counterfactual where there is no inaction, where there is a inaction, where the government does not intervene, what would have happened? And then there you can see uh, uh, how, um, I think you can do three things. One is, if there is no signaling effect, how it will look like. One is, if you have signaling effect, and one if you don't do anything. And then you can use that as a benchmark to have the multipliers against this uh, signaling. But we have, so we haven't done that. I, I, I cannot do it, but we can do it. I think that's a, it's a good advice. And that's what a macroeconomic model yes. is for, yeah. <laughs> because that's where we can run all these experiments. And in that sense, maybe the, I think the question of the talk was, can macroeconomic models uh, save us? Or, so <laughs> I think, yeah, I would, maybe that, they can. I think it, they will give us ideas. It would mm. be, it's better to be vaguely right they're then totally wrong. That's what Kane said, no? And I think that's what the models are about. And I think so in the end I would say yes, they would help us at the margin. Okay. Thank so, you. Thank you very much. That was a very nice conclusion, I think. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and uh, food and drinks uh, in the other ceremon Thank ceremonial. You.